Hey guys, so this year's London Summit, the theatres aren't recorded and so we thought we might as well do our own recording of this session, how to implement AWS cost optimization strategy that works. So please enjoy the rest of this presentation. Why should you care about cost optimization? This is a question that maybe you are asking yourself watching this video, or maybe this is something that you ask generally in your organization. And people ask me this question a lot. People think the answer is this. We need to spend less. You've been told by someone senior in your organization that you need to spend less money in the cloud. But does that really work? Does that actually make you care about spending less? Well, after speaking to others in the industry, I don't think this is the reason. So. Here are five reasons why you should care about spending less in the cloud. Number one, efficient development. AWS has the well-architected pillars and cost optimization is one of them. Being efficient in the cloud and using it to the full advantage means being cost optimized. Recognition, be selfish. Be the person who saved your company money. This is a great way for you to look good at work. Be sustainable, be greener. Wasting less money on unnecessary resources means wasting less energy. Looking for better business success or creating more value from the work that you do means that the company itself will be a success. And finally, reallocation. Some of my customers are looking to optimize their cloud spend so they don't have to do layoffs or fire people in their companies. That's huge. But on a kind of fun, more, less depressing note, remember that little project you wish you had a little bit more budget from? Cost optimization means you might have that. So with that in mind, today, I'm gonna to share with you how to implement an AWS cost optimization strategy that works. My name is Steph Gooch, and I'm a, in a team called Optics at AWS, and I'm a senior solution architect. Before that, I was a developer of many years, and then I was head of FinOps. Once we've gone through this optimization strategy, I will be handing it over to David from Just Eat to tell you more. So let's get on with this optimization strategy. This optimization strategy encapsulates all elements of like a FinOps journey. This is a model I use with my customers and I'm gonna give you a high level concept of each of them and then we're gonna dive into each one specifically. The first one is ownership and partnership. Who needs to be involved? It might actually be more people than you think. Cost allocation. Everybody needs to be responsible for their spend in the cloud. And they, it's key that they know this and they know where they can find this information from. Cost visibility. This is very different when we were on-prem previously. Finance managed all the cost. They saw the same numbers coming out every month. However, as we have moved to the cloud, we've become more flexible, the things change all the time, but we need to make sure that we can track that spend and see what's actually going on. Cost optimization, big topic, obviously. And what we're gonna talk about is some non-architectural changes and some architectural changes you can make to be more cost optimized. In this slot, I'll give you some tips and some different ways in which you can optimize your services today. Cost tracking. Now we've done all that optimization work. How do we see what success looks like? How do we see that we're doing well? And what KPIs can we create? Cost reviews. What questions should we be asking about all of these steps? Underpinning these is education. Making sure that everyone involved understands technology, services, concepts is vital for a successful journey. So let's start off with ownership and partnership. People who should be involved with FinOps and optimization extend through these roles that are on the screen. It's key that they all understand what their role is. Starting off with the specialists, they need to know the ins and outs of cost spend and optimization in the organization, have a view of what's going on everywhere. They'll also often be the people who have maybe done the certifications or have dived into ways in which they can optimize and educate the rest of the firm. But then we move into the 
top-down approach, those executive, the project managers, the people that are driving FinOps from the top down, meaning that you know it, it is crucial to the business. It is important that they set the precedent that this is really important. Otherwise, who's going to take it seriously? In the middle, we have finance. As I said before, they've moved from a very static model to this flexible model. So they need to understand the language of cost and see why this is happening. And finally, engineering and operations. People with hands on keyboards, the ones who are actually building stuff. They're the people that need to be really striving for that optimization goal. Now, I'm not saying that you need a dedicated team with every single one of these personas. If you can, that's great. But being realistic, that's not always the case. But what I am saying is that you need to have these people involved in the conversation. Like I said, everybody needs to understand their roles and play their part. So now we know who's involved, let's talk about allocating spend. How are you meant to organize your data? Well, an efficient account structure is one way in which you can simplify the process. This is something that's very relevant if you want to do chargeback, cost allocation or showback. This will make your life easier. Some of you may have seen me present this slide before, but I do think it's really important to set that groundwork and it does help you in the long term. So starting from the top, we have our AWS organization. This looks out over your entire estate of AWS spend, often in the payer. Within these, we have our organizational units, our naturally occurring groups of accounts that are based on teams, products, whatever works best for your account. Then those things within them are the linked accounts. What's really important here is on the slide, you can see they have different names with things like environment information, such as production, development. This is crucial because when it comes to our resources, RS3s, or EC2s, those things we build every day, you no longer need to tag them with that production information because that's at the account level. We know that that is established. This means that when it comes to allocating costs, you don't have to try and tra tag every resource. Your engineers don't have to tag every resource. You can just kind of gather that information from the top down. Luckily, we can get all this information from our AWS organization and the QR code on the screen leads you to the well-architected labs where there is a way in which you can pull all this data and connect it to your spend. Having this model means that you can quickly see who has spent what and where. So how do we actually see those specific costs? What is that spend data? So with cost visibility, there are three main ways in which you can see it spent. First of all, we have Cost Explorer. This allows you to filter, group, and get insights into your data. And it's often the simplest and the fastest option for you to see spent. This is really great it's in all your linked accounts. It's free, it's in your kind of organization account. And it's really, really useful. If you haven't used it, go check it out. But say you wanna get a little bit more granular. You wanna go down to that resource level of information. That's where the AWS cost and use report or the CUR comes in. This is a super granular report. It's huge. Please, please don't try and download this and open it on your laptop. It will break. It is massive, it's massive. Please also don't try and print it off. My manager tried to do that and definitely killed an entire tree. But don't worry, we can help you access this by using Athena as a way to set it up straight out of the box where you can query that data, it lives in S3, and you can start using SQL to investigate where your spend is going. This could be on individual resources per hour, using tags, lots and lots of information in there that's great on your optimization journey. But you might be thinking, I don't really know how to start with that. And that QR code will help you. There is a Cur query library to get you started with lots of queries for it. But you might just want a simple out the box solution to actually visualize your spend. And that is where the cloud intelligence dashboards come in. These dashboards are extensive and very, very detailed. They help you visualize your spend, looking at commitments, looking at optimizations, lots of different views and lots of different types of dashboards. If you take anything from my talk, I really do urge you to try these dashboards out. They are very lightweight. You deploy them into your accounts on your cost and usage report, and you have full control of them. The subscriptions are based on quick site licenses. Nothing is costing for the actual dashboards themselves. 
and you can edit them, delete them, do whatever you like with them in your account. There are a couple of different types and I will go into a little bit more detail when we get to the tracking section of this talk. So now we can see our data. How do we optimize it? We're going to look at optimization through these two lenses, technical complexity against its cost saving impact. And starting off out the gate, we have commitments. Reserved instances, savings plans. These are those non-architectural changes you can make to save money immediately. They're a way to make sure that you get the most bang for your buck. I do urge you when you're buying these to staircase. So I'm, what I mean by that is buy a little bit and then grow gradually over time. You don't want to do one massive purchase because the cloud is flexible. Things change. We know this. So we need to make sure we can change with the times. Maybe look at your production environment and think, OK, what services can I cover with these commitments here? And then you can expand over time. Going a little bit more technical and a little bit lower cost saving is elasticity. So two parts to this, scheduling, really important one, making sure that you're only using the resources when you actually need them. The same way as when you left your house today, or when maybe you're still at home watching this, is in the other room, your light's not on if you're not in that room. The same is with your EC2s and your RDSs and your other services. When you're not using them, turn them off. The other part is auto scaling groups, kind of being flexible with the cloud, growing and shrinking as you need. And people often just think of EC2s with this. But nowadays we have ECS, RDS storage and DynamoDB. So there is more for you to look at when it comes to auto scaling groups. Coming right down the bottom, we have something that a lot of people love to do when it comes to optimization, and that is getting rid of idle resources. This is a, such a satisfying way and a simple way to save money quickly. Finding resources that have been created that you're no longer needing and deleting them. However, when people do this, they often just get trigger happy and delete all the stuff they don't need without looking at why it's there in the first place. So if you are doing this kind of optimization, dive into the data, figure out where these things are coming from, why they were created, why they're idle. And then you can work backwards from that to say, OK, is there a bug we need to fix? Is there do we need to move to more infrastructure as code? Do we need to set more parameters up? Use this as a stepping stone to improve generally rather than just deleting everything. The other thing on here is S3 lifecycle management. I'm not going to go into this today in a huge amount of detail, but the simple thing is use the level of storage you need based on how frequently you're accessing your objects. And if you're not sure where to start, check out S3 intelligent tiering. Moving right onto that technical complexity side, we have efficiency, looking at right sizing this time. So making sure that the resources you use are big enough for what you need, but not too big. Don't be wasting space you don't need. For this, we always want to make sure that we're checking and reviewing our optimization. I'm going to mention a tool that we're going to use that later. Going up a little bit, we have modernization. AWS is great in the fact that it gives you often a cheaper price for the newest resources. So we really encourage you to check out things like Graviton, a great way for you to save instantly, especially when it comes to managed services. Things like RDS moving to Graviton can be done in a maintenance window very quickly, and you can save about 10% on that. With things like AC2, we have a 40% price performance saving. So 20% out of the box given to you, and then the other 20% is because you can often use a smaller instance. So we're going to that right size here again. So you're spending less money. Finally, we have cost aware architecture, right up at the top, the best way to save money, but also the hardest sometimes. So rather than lift and shift, think about how you can build in the cloud to actually be more efficient. One thing to say is don't necessarily need to do this in this order. This is a variety of different ways in which you can optimize in your accounts, but it depends on your infrastructure. So if you are going to do some of these optimizations, figure out which is going to get you the biggest saving and the most impact and the longest term impact. Could you do a little bit of deleting out of resources while figuring out how to use serverless? Yes. Have lots of different things going on, but make sure they are worth the time to do. So now you've done all this optimization, how do you actually track this? 
So I wanted to touch on this idea of what does good look like? And we do this with unit cost. Unit cost is just the total expenditure for one unit of something. But what does this mean in the cloud? Well, if you look at this diagram, we have a first bar, someone has started spending money in the cloud and maybe you're migrating your services. So every month you spend more and it gradually grows and grows and grows. But the question is, are you experiencing this month over month spend because you're migrating more to the cloud and spending more or because you're being inefficient? For example, are you spending more because your application is doing well? There's so much demand. Everything's really exciting. We need to build, build, build. Or because somebody on day two built something poorly and now you're spending too much. How do we know? This is where unit cost comes in. By having a cost per transaction, per user, per click, or cloud specific per compute, CPU, storage, gigabyte, you're able to see through that usage to understand what's actually going on. So you can see that in this picture, their usage was going up, but their unit cost was going down, meaning they were getting more for their spend in the cloud. I mentioned a couple of different ideas, but definitely check out things that KPIs for this, like unit cost for storage and compute you can find in those cloud intelligence dashboards or pull in lots of data. Some tips, for example, are pull in all your user information and connect it to your cost and usage data it means that you can see things like this unit cost. When you are providing these kind of KPIs, make sure that everyone understands what the goals are, where you're getting this data from, and what it actually means, because unit cost might not be something that everybody has used before. A simple thing you can do as well is try and centralize your data. Don't use Excel sheets, pull it all in, maybe attach it to your in the S3 bucket with your cost and use report and use Athena. Going off those KPIs, let's look at some of those reviews I was talking about. So a couple of different personas we have here. So we have those stakeholder reports. So going back to the slide earlier, we have our different personas. So those top down personas, they wanna care about the high level information, costs related to applications to how well the business is doing. That is where maybe our KPI dashboard would suit well for this. But developers, they care about the per resource, per account. They care about a different level of information. They also care about optimizing. So make sure that you provide them with that information that's relevant to doing their job. And when it comes to finance, they often have a format they need to use, and it's your job to give them that format. So using things like our cost intelligence dashboard, a high level view will give them a lot of that insight, but make sure that they can get it in a CSV if they need it or have all the relevant kind of business information. As I said, these can be uh, gotten through the cloud intelligence dashboard as a way to start, or you can even try querying the cost and use report yourself. Finally, on to education. And I just wanted to highlight some tools. Feel free to take a screenshot of this. This is kind of a collective of uh, lots of different tools that you can use for cost optimization. But wanted to pinpoint a couple. So the first is AWS budgets. If you want to set an expectation for your spend and then see if it goes against that, see if you're getting close to that, AWS budgets is the one for you. If you haven't got an AWS budget in your account, get one. Another side of this is AWS cost anomaly detection. So on the budgets, if you have a, you have a flat number that you're gonna track your spend against, and if you hit that budget, you'll be alerted. Whereas anomaly is looking for outliers, things that you weren't expecting. So if your EC2 spend is growing every month, that's not an anomaly. But if a Lambda suddenly starts spiking in spend, you'll get a notification. We mentioned right sizing earlier. For this, check out Compute Optimizer, free tool in which will provide you with recommendations to resize your instances based on if they're too big or too small. And finally, S3 Storage Lens, really, really great tool. Would highly recommend viewing this. It's a, again, it's default in your account in S3 is where you can find it. And will give you an overview dashboard of what you're storing, where you're storing it, how much you're storing, what types of tiers you have. And from this, you can figure out kind of what patterns there are and maybe go to a different tier. So enough theory from me, let's hear from someone who is actually doing this in their job. And so we're gonna bring in David from Just Eat to tell you more about how they've put in an optimization strategy. 
Thanks, Steph. Hey, everyone. I'm Dave Andrews from Just Eat Takeaway. Uh, and I'm going to take you through some of the things we've done over a number of years that have influenced cost culture and tried to increase cost optimization. <clears throat> so a quick briefing in case you don't know who we are. We're a leading global online food delivery marketplace. We're in 20 markets globally. And fundamentally, what we do is link up a huge customer base with a huge choice of restaurants and food types and including an ever growing list of grocery partners. Uh, our team are also distributed globally, which I'll touch on shortly. So how did we do in 2022? We took 984 million orders, just shy of a billion, and that averaged out to 1,800 orders a minute every single minute of the year. And whilst that's a high number, if you just think about the takeaway business for, for a minute, you know directly that that's not going to be quite the case. We are still a business that does a lot more trade in the evenings than we do at lunchtime than we do in the mornings. So immediately that has a requirement on us as a technical capability. We need to scale. We need to scale up in the evenings and ideally scale back down again uh, in the quiet times to save money. We use auto scaling for a lot of that and some schedule scaling as, as well. We also need to be super reliable. Uh, again, if you think about takeaway business, when you're ordering in the evening, you log onto the app, you want, to, you want it all to be available. If you can't search for restaurants or you can't use the, the functions in the, in the app, then it, quite quickly you're going to get frustrated and move elsewhere, be that a competitor or even to the kitchen. So reliability is super, super important to us. Primarily, we're made up of four major platforms. Uh, that's Grubhub in the States, Skip the Dishes in Canada, Takeaway platforms in Central Europe, uh, Just Eat platforms in parts of Central Europe, UK, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. And the numbers that I'm going to show you next are really a subset of some of those. And we're in the process of consolidating some of those into a more global uh, platform as well. So we've got 230 plus AWS accounts. Uh, 2,500 microservices and 250 plus engineering teams. Um, in terms of the engineering teams, really, really important. Um, mostly they are fully accountable and own their entire stack. What, what does that mean? It means they're responsible for improving the product that goes out to customers, restaurants and couriers, but they're also responsible for their, their technical debt, their technical roadmap, reliability, on call, security and costs. So. That's really cool because you've got a single product backlog and then you've got clear priorities for the team, but it demonstrates really, really quickly how busy that team is going to be and how hard it is to get things to the top of that list. And those teams are distributed globally. We've got 40 plus EKS clusters, although we use a wide range of AWS services. Uh, I already mentioned we're super high available, reliability is really important, but I didn't mention kind of speed to market. We make around 7,500 releases a month uh, that's in the Just Eat platform and the Skip the Dishes platform alone. Speed to market is really, really important to us. We try and make lots and lots of small changes uh, so that we're always kind of testing uh, on a small isolated basis what the, how the market responds to those things. Also means we've got a small blast radius and that allows us to try and keep pushing in innovation as a theme within Just Eat Takeaway. Key messages. So strategies to influence cost culture. First up is avoid. Um, what can we do centrally without involving teams at all? Really important, this one. Within FinOps, you know, always near the top of the survey is how do we get engineering teams to take action? With that in mind, we should make sure we're doing everything we can without the engineering teams, as simple as that. Make it easy. So where we do need the engineering teams to take action, how do we make those things really, really small, which increases our chances of getting them done? And finally, making it visible. How can we make everything else easier for the engineering teams to see what they need to do? So avoid. But first up, paying less. So driving the commercial rate down so that we're spending less at the end of the month. We use a rolling savings plan strategy. Um, barcode, QR code there. AWS did a good blog on this a little while ago. I'm going to cover this really, really briefly. But if you've not heard about this before, please go and head up the blog. Um, so our rolling savings plan strategy, Steph alluded to this earlier on, basically means buy little and often. We've got roughly 15 to 18 purchase points throughout the year, so just over one a month. And it means that not only are we constantly topping up our purchases, but they are also frequently expiring. And that's really the key point of this, that because we've got things that are always expiring, we can always reduce our risk at short notice and our coverage. So we only have to wait three or four weeks and we can reduce our coverage and another three or four weeks and we can go down again. So that way, if ever we reduce our usage, we can, we can optimize our saving strategy, saving strategy rather than 
be holding on to things that we've got to wait for for 12 months. That allows us to run at roughly 95% coverage and 100% utilization. That's a fairly consistent average throughout the year. It does deviate fractionally. Caveats, best works at scale. Um, certainly if you want to be aggressive, at least, um, the rolling savings plan strategy, you can use at any scale, but certainly for going for high numbers, scale is important. Why? If you've got 10 engineering teams and one of them does something fundamentally different to their workload, you're going to notice that's going to be a perhaps 5 10% lift or, or reduction in the bill. That could blow your savings plan strategy out of the water. When you've got 250 plus engineering teams, those things get swallowed up fairly easy by each other. So just to kind of replay this avoid area, we're not talking to engineers here and engineering teams. And to get around that with savings plan strategy, we are still talking to uh, initiative owners and big projects. We want to know exactly what they're doing and when big changes might happen so we can fold that into our plans. And then how do we use less? You know, so fundamentally, how are we using less stuff so that we're paying less at the end of the month? And these are things that we can automate centrally and just some examples of some of the things you can do and some of the things that we do. So stopping use of expensive regions or large instance types, you can prevent that out of the box. Uh, and if you do that, that's never into the engineering conscious. They don't need to worry about it. It's something else they've got reminded to do. It's not something you chase later on when you're trying to reduce money. Automating cost avoidance. So good example here would be non-prod scaling tools. FinOps principle, use the variable cost of the cloud. Well, actually, in, in production, we're talking about scaling up and down to meet workloads. When we're talking non-production, those things probably aren't used out of hours. So we've built those tools centrally, but we do allow our engineers to configure them for their own resources. That way, when we've got global teams, teams can run their environments when they need to. Deletion of unattached volumes, just another example of where we've deemed that one safe to do. Steph talked about kind of caution around deleting idle resources, and I definitely agree with that. You need to decide what can you do centrally that's safe to do, or you want the team to own. And finally, automates part of deployment. Uh, cost optimal defaults, so new instance types or GP3 volumes, we have good examples of where you can give those things for free for new services. And another one is tagging. So we tag as part of deployment. <clears throat> the pipeline does that for the engineers. The engineers actually take no action to tag their resources. Um, and how we do that is because the teams declare their data in something called platform metadata. And then the pipeline tooling lifts and shifts that to the resources when they're deployed. Um, that's really useful as a strategy because what it avoids is any kind of naming convention problems of teams naming themselves something one day or another name another day or a typo a different day. And then when you're trying to write automation on top of all those tags, you've got these different variables which actually mean the same thing. If you're putting that from a, a single source of the truth, you've kind of removed a bit of complexity there. A couple of caveats. Requires technical resource and ongoing ownership. So within your FinOps team, if you've got technical resources, that's great. You can get some of this stuff done, but the chances are it's still probably going to overlap with things that other teams own. Um, if you haven't got any resources, you're going to have to use business cases and get co-sponsorship to get these things built and maintained on an ongoing basis. Next up, reduce effort. And effort is a barrier to adoption. This slide is really, really, really common sense, uh, but we don't always do it. And just to be really, really clear, you know, if we need 250 engineering teams to do five minutes work or five hours work, it doesn't take a genius to work out which one you've got more chance of getting done and, and which speed as well. So if you try and make the change they need to perform as small as possible, you've got much more chance of success. So there's a saying in Just Eat, uh, which is in Just Eat Takeaway, you're a PR away from happiness, which actually means more around related to our internal uh, open source culture, where if there's a problem with someone else's service that you don't like or you think can be improved, you can raise a pull request against their service. They'll review it, and if they agree, they'll, they'll push that change or go through automated testing and we move to production. We can take that PR process as a strategy. And this isn't just applying to FinOps. I think this applies to InfoSec and platform engineering as a wider group. If we can push PRs into teams repos and do the heavy lifting ourselves, it makes it a lot easier for the engineering teams to then make those changes. So a good example here is a couple of years ago, we went with an external uh, load balancing SaaS solution. It turned out to be unreliable. The maintenance was really, really high and actually ended up being more cost than we expected as well. So we ended up rolling back to AWS ALBs and we did that through building that kind of heavy lifting automation ourselves and pushing those PRs into Teams repos. 
Uh, and because of that, the kind of speed of execution of that project across all of our teams and all of our platforms was really, really quick. And the rest, making it as easy as you can and really focusing on cost visibility here. And, and the following is kind of like the journey that we've been on at Just Eat over a number of years. So when I first started nearly eight years ago, um, engineering teams couldn't see their costs at all, uh, which as you can imagine is an absolute hard blocker on engagement. Why would teams care about costs if they can't even see them? Well, actually they did care about costs when we decided we were spending too much and spreadsheets get sent around asking you to reduce money and can you do this? Can you do that? So on and so forth. And that's kind of like what I've always called the pendulum uh, method of cost is a problem. Now it's not again, we're going to focus on something else and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger until you pivot back to it. That's not what we want when we're talking cost culture. We want little and often. And so we started supplementing that with point in time spreadsheets. Um, these were sent out monthly to heads of engineering, uh, contained their whole department's costs. Um, so they were useful, uh, but they're still not great feedback. You know, if an engineer has made a change on the second of the month, the report gets sent out on the fifth of the following month. The head of engineering doesn't read it for another two weeks. That's a six week cycle gone before actually that engineer, who might have even left the org by now, can take any action. So supplementing that is direct access to the tooling to view costs. Now we've got real-time access, that's great. But to really increase the maturity, we need to go through this cycle, which is cost allocated, tagging, and automation built in. With that in place, we can build real-time team reports, which is much reduced noise for them. So if we can, when they log in, if they can see their own costs only, you've taken away a few extra steps of having to set up the right filters, being reminded of what tags they need to set, all of that can be done for them, making it really, really easy. With tagging and automation in place, we can push an anomaly straight to owners. So now we can give real-time feedback on spikes and deviations from their usual spend. And the one that we've gone after is potential wastage identified for you. So we're just trying to get potential wastage out directly to a team so they've got a defined list of things they can do to reduce their costs. And that spectrum, we're talking about trying to reduce blockers to engagement and making it really, really easy with the aim that we are getting increased cost optimization. How do we do that? Um, so we're constantly scanning AWS. Uh, we've got cloud custodian policies running and cloud ability, and that's pushing data frequently into Backstage. Backstage is our developer portal where the developers are on a daily basis. So we're pushing that wastage information alongside the other bits of information that they use all the time. Uh, just to be clear here though, we're not trying to replicate, replicate cost explorer cloud ability in Backstage. It's just the, the wastage and high level data we wanna push into Backstage. Why? increased likelihood of teams reducing wastage, but also to give them dollar value. It's very easy to make a decision. If they're going through some sort of cost report in Cloudability or AWS where they can see all their costs, they've got to work out where they can save money and then they've got to balance those things off, perhaps to do some maths. We can do that for them and give them just a list with the highest value thing at the top. They can work out how much effort that will take and they can work out which one they want to do. It also gives us meta level data. We can see how much wastage we're carrying as an organization, which is super useful. So for each potential wastage item, we've got a dollar value, which I've already mentioned. We've also got a description and guidance. Um, so we want everyone to know why something has popped up in the portal. Most of it's fairly intuitive, but we really want to remove any ambiguity and then kind of give clear guidance on what action they might take. Just to be really clear here, there's an action they might take. Anything we think we can do safely centrally, we should do. So now we're on to engineering teams making decisions on things like right-sizing, as an example. Talking of right-sizing, aggregated right-sizing recommendations. So AWS and Cloudability, they're scanning resources and telling you which resources could be optimized, which is great, but teams work in services. We don't want to send a list of 20 potential resources which relate to the same single service to a team. We want to give them one item, one item, one dollar value so they can work out where the business value is. And finally, an exception option built in. This one's really important as well. So good examples here would be things like disaster recovery environments or staging environments or warm standbys, things that run at production level capacity, but are mostly they're fairly idle. Now that's a strategic decision. It's not the team's decision to run at that size. That's what we want them to do. So we want to be able to skip those things out of this portal. The other thing here is human nature. We don't want the wastage portal to be full of things that teams are taught to ignore on a daily basis. Before long, teams will start ignoring other bits of information or, or missing real opportunities. 
Just to kind of close off, um, Steph mentioned the cost optimization levers and our wastage plugin was designed to really attack some of those, but not all of them. Um, it really tried to move us from those kind of point in time cost saving drives to making this wastage data available frequently and all of the time. But it does mean if you're trying to attack all of the cost optimization levers, which over time you should do, you need different tools and techniques such as the rolling savings plan strategy for all the commitments. Thanks, Steph, and back over to you. Thank you so much. Awesome. So we will continue on with just wanting to summarize this slide again and kind of link it up to what David was talking about. There are so many ways in which they're doing great work at Just Eat and the success that they've had and the way they're going with the more automation approach is definitely where this kind of optimization work is headed. To link it back together, if we look at these stages, things like ownership and partnership, for example, in Just Eat, the FinOps team own the savings plans. That's their job, it's established. With cost allocation, they have automated tagging, taking that work off those engineers. For visibility, they don't use spreadsheets. They have a way they can share that data so everyone can see what they're building. For defaults and optimization, they have savings plans, they have making things default. There's a lot of different ways in which they're kind of picking and choosing the ways that can be the most beneficial for them. And even suggesting that the teams take on that right sizing work specific to their applications rather than just resources. For tracking, they have KPIs like 95% coverage that is established and they know they have to meet that requirement. And for cost reviews, they have real time data and anomalies that go straight to the owners. So previously, when I have given a talk like this before, that would have been the end. We've given you a FinOp strategy. However, I was given this title by the powers that be, and I felt like there was something else that could be added. And it was because of this, that that works part. This strategy does work as you just saw with Just Eat, but there is another element that really makes it crucial for it to be a success. And that's these guys. Many customers come to me saying that they are banging their heads against the wall, trying to get engineers to take action to join in with this optimization strategy. Because people like you, you want to be optimized. You want your companies to do well in this world. But you can't seem to like break that barrier with engineers. And I feel like we blame them for not taking it seriously with things like, I don't care about FinOps. But that might not necessarily be true. So I want to propose a new way of working with engineers. I want us to ask engineers what they actually care about. Luckily for us, I used to be an engineer. So I'm gonna put my engineering hat back on and uh, take on that role and ask, what do engineers actually care about? As an engineer, I care about meeting my deadlines. I care about getting work done on time. I have security, fin ops, updates, so much to do that adding more work in the wrong format just won't get done. But I also care about using new technologies. I love building, I love automation, getting my hands dirty and trying new stuff with the cloud. But really, I care about career progression. I want to be recognized for the work that I do. Does that help? Thank you, Dev Steph. So she gave us some great context and I'm going to use those to give you three ways in which you can power your engineers to take action and move towards that optimization goal. The first is integrate. Match how engineers work. Dev Steph spoke about having lots on, and FinOps can often be this Excel sheet that gets sent around for people to do extra work. But that's not how engineers work. They go via ticket systems, via sprints. They have methods in which they create work. So match this. Work with the project owners to get tasks put in with the right information, the appropriate format, and the correct priority and it'll get done. Intrigue. Dev Steph mentioned building stuff, enjoying that. Engineers, they do, they like messing around with new technology, trying different things. And that's great for FinOps. When we went through the optimizations that you could do using new services like Spot, Graviton, Serverless are all ways in which you can optimize. 
So make sure you can put these out there to the engineers, have lunch and learn sessions, share trainings, add it to onboarding methods, or even speak to your AWS teams to bring in experts to give them educational sessions. When it comes to automation, challenge your engineers. If they don't wanna be deleting the same resources every month, help them to suggest automating it. Not only will this solve the problem for them, but it also can be reused. On to the last one, which is probably the most important, and that's Inspire. Getting career recognition is really important for the work when it comes to FinOps. A customer of mine set up a monthly cadence where they highlight the teams that are doing the best optimization work. Give them a chance to shine, to show off, but also inspire other engineers to take action. This will only also mean that you get a FinOps champion in your engineering teams that can advocate for this optimization. You can use these highlights for reviews, for promos, to showcase the great work that they are doing. So when it comes to using your engineers to do optimization strategy, follow the three eyes, integrate, intrigue, and inspire, and work with them to do this. So last thing I want to mention is the call to action. So come here tomorrow. This is what I want you guys to do. Go speak to your developers. Maybe order some cake from Just Eat to have that open communication and ask them what their goals are. What do they care about? And maybe in that conversation, you can work together to make sure that you define that optimization strategy moving forward. If you've been inspired and want to learn more about the amazing world of optimization and FinOps, please check out the FinOps uh, Keys to AWS Optimization show on AWS Twitch. It's a weekly show, 3.30 hour time on uh, GMT Plus One at the moment. And it has many different guests covering a range of topics. We have a backlog of lots of different episodes with lots of different playlists based on different personas. So if you do want to share to anybody else in your company, send them this way. Lastly, thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this. Please, please let us know how we did by filling out the survey, but also email me adabessteph at amazon.com or tweet me adabessteph. If any of this has been helpful and you've used it, we love to hear those success stories. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.